Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Gavin Midgley, and I'm very pleased to be able to uh, present to you a little uh, introduction uh, to what we do here on the uh, MSc uh, course. Um, what we're going to look at today is a little bit of management accounting, and to do so, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, relevant costing and the costs involved uh, in a cake that I made. Now, uh, what you're seeing here, um, that isn't a picture of a cake, that's a lump of butter, that wouldn't be very impressive as a cake. Uh, but I've got my cake right here. Can you see that? See, it's very nice there. And I made this entirely. Um, and because I'm at home, nobody can prove that I didn't make it. So there we are. There's my cake there that I made. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the costs involved um, in making that cake. Now, you might think, what's this got to do uh, with management accounting? Well, whether you are making a cake or you might be running a business uh, and you're looking to make a new product and sell it, uh, you're going to want to know what are going to be the costs involved. If you're thinking about launching into a new business, a new venture, um, obviously you're looking to make money, you're looking to make revenue, but there's going to be costs involved. And you need to look at what costs will be involved in making a particular decision. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to look at it through the costs of uh, my cake. So in my cake, how much money did I spend uh, to make the uh, the cake. Well, believe it or not, I only used three ingredients in my cake. I used flour, uh, butter and chocolate. And we all know that those can make a very nice cake. So let's have a look at um, how much I actually spent to make that cake. So starting with flour. So I was a bit lucky with the flour. I already got three bags of flour in my kitchen. So I just used one of the bags of flour to make my cake. Uh, so I didn't need to spend any money, so no spending there. Normally, those bags cost five pounds, uh, but here the spending was zero. Uh, now, for the butter, uh, this is a little bit different. Uh, my wife, um, she wanted to make some donuts, so she asked me to get uh, her a tub of butter. So I got her some butter, and there was some left over, so I was able to use that to um, make my cake. So um, I had to buy that tub of butter, so that cost me eight pounds. So I spent eight pounds on that tub of butter. And then finally, uh, chocolate. Now, believe it or not, uh, I, uh, I'm not a big chocolate fan. So I don't usually buy some chocolate, but um, somebody gave me some uh, for Christmas. Um, and it's still OK. I found some in the kitchen. So I was able to use that, the, the chocolate that I had left over in the kitchen. So that didn't cost me any money either. So how much money did I spend? Well, I only spent the eight pounds for that tub of butter. So my total spending was only eight pounds. So I was pretty pleased with that. But the first thing we need to make clear is that when we're talking about a relevant cost, the relevant cost isn't necessarily going to be equal to the money that you've spent. What we mean by a relevant cost is we mean any cash outflow that we incur either now or in the future um, when we make a specific decision. So if we're talking about a relevant cost in this case, in terms of making the cake, what are the cash outflows that we incur from making that cake as opposed to the other course of action, which is not making the cake? So we're looking at the difference between how much did I need to spend making the cake or what were the costs involved in making the cake, as opposed to um, if I didn't make the cake. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through those ingredients again, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about what the relevant uh, cost was. So let's go back first to the flour. And this is what I said about the flour. So I said I had three bags in the kitchen. I've already bought them. Uh, and I used one bag without, um, so I was able to use one for my cake. So I didn't have to spend any money. So I didn't, uh, my spending was zero. And as I said, a bag usually costs five pounds. So I didn't have to spend any money, but uh, of course I am now one less uh, bag of flour uh, in my kitchen. So I now have one less bag than I did that if I hadn't have made the cake. So instead of three, I've now got two. And here's the key point. If I'm regularly using flour for other things, so if I, if I choose to make other things, 
then at some point that flower that I used I will need to replace it so regardless of whether I have flower or not if there is a material or an item that you are regularly using sooner or later uh, you will need to replace it let me give you an example uh, with something that everybody uses uh, and that's toilet roll now uh, we've had a bit of a situation with toilet roll uh, uh, in my area recently a lot of people going out and rushing out to buy lots of uh, toilet roll so you might have five rolls in your house currently or you might have 50 rolls in your house um, but even if you've got 50 rolls if you use one at some point you're going to need to replace it you're going to need to buy another one now that might not be until next week it might not be until next year if you've got lots of them but if there's something that you are regularly using in constant use then you'll need to replace it and so the relevant cost is the cost of replacing it so with the flower because I'm regularly using flour because I've used a bag for my cake there is a relevant cost and that relevant cost is the cost of replacing that flour so the relevant cost is that five pounds the cost of replacing it of course the cost of flour could go up and if it goes up before I replace it the replacement cost is going to get even higher so I could come back and revise um, how much it's going to cost to replace but as for now we would say that relevant cost is five pounds because that's the cost of replacing it so that's the relevant cost with the flour let's contrast that with the chocolate now do you remember when I said that I didn't like chocolate and so I don't usually buy it um, but I had some lying around in the kitchen so I was able to use that so again I didn't spend any money now can you see the difference between the flour and the chocolate in that here because I don't like chocolate and because I usually don't buy it it's not something that's in regular use and so therefore um, there's no replacement if I don't want to get it then I don't need to replace it so I'm free to use it up so because it's not in regular use there's no replacement cost you only have a replacement cost for the items that are in regular use so if we think about a business um, say if they're making a product and that product requires uh, oil for example if the business is using oil for other products then regardless of how much oil they've got if they use it for the product they're going to need to replace it but if it's using something that they're not constantly using then there's no replacement cost so we can see the contrast between the um, the flour and the chocolate here so where there's a replacement cost or not uh, depends on the regular use so let's look at the final uh, ingredient uh, of my cake which was the butter and just remind myself of what I said here so I had to buy a tub of butter for my wife as she wanted to make some donuts so I used what was left over from the tub and the tub cost eight pounds so I've spent eight pounds in buying that tub but we're looking at the relevant cost here and the relevant cost is the cash outflow that I incurred because I made the cake as opposed to not making the cake and if we think about this I needed to buy that butter for my wife uh, for, the, for her donuts even if I didn't make the cake then I still needed to buy that butter so I'd have still spent the eight pounds so whether I made the cake or not doesn't affect the spending does it so that's what we call a sunk cost so this is a cost that we've already incurred in the past and is not affected by our decision so that tub of butter I needed to buy it uh, regardless of whether I made the cake or not so I've already incurred that cost whether I make a cake or not makes no difference so that's what we call a sunk cost and a sunk cost is not a relevant cost so this would mean what's the relevant cost of making this cake in terms of the butter 
um, it would be zero because using the leftover butter didn't require me to spend any more money. So that would mean that the relevant cost would be zero if it were a sunk cost. However, there was something uh, I didn't tell you at the start, and that's relevant to the issue of the butter. Uh, so remember, I bought the tub for my wife because she wanted to make some donuts. And then I thought, oh, there's half a tub left. I'll use that to make my cake. Unfortunately, that didn't go down too well. Um, because it turns out my wife was hoping to use that leftover butter. So she was looking to make some cookies. And so the next day, uh, she opens the fridge and finds the butter's not there because I've used it. So uh, my wife wasn't very happy about that. Um, and the result of that was that she was going to, uh, she was planning to give me 20 pounds as a birthday present. Uh, but now, um, yeah, because of the upset over the butter, uh, she didn't give me that £20. So I've missed out on £20 that I would have had. Um, if I hadn't made the cake, the butter would still be there and I've had £20. So what I've missed out on there, that's what we call an opportunity cost. And that's an um, amount of cash that you lose through not taking up an opportunity. So if we if I could have turned back the clock and I bought butter for myself uh, or not made the cake, I would have had um, that 20 pounds, of course, less the eight pounds um, if I would bought that tub for myself. So if I bought a tub for myself as well as hers, I'd have spent eight pounds, but I would have got 20 pounds back. So there's an opportunity cost there of 12 pounds. That's 12 pounds that I have missed out on if I'd bought a tub for myself, uh, because then I would have got 20 pounds back. So we've got an opportunity cost of uh, 12 pounds. Now, in this scenario, it might be a little bit difficult thinking about what is an opportunity cost. So let's look at it in terms of a business. Supposing you've got um, a, a production line in a factory and you've got staff uh, making a product. Now, if you want, was thinking about making a new product, you might be tempted to think, well, I'm already employing the staff that we have. Um, they're already being paid. So whether I make the product or not, um, that's a sunk cost because um, we've already got them on hand to make it. So if they're on, assuming that they are on a permanent contract, so assuming that the, the payment to them is guaranteed, we'll need to pay them regardless of what they do. And even if they're not doing anything, then we still need to pay them. So the wages would be regarded as a sunk cost, but can you see how there could be an opportunity cost? Because if we have staff and we say, right, we want you to make product A, what's the relevant cost of making product A for that labor staff? Well, of course, we could have got them to make product B or product C or something else and could have, we could have made money that way. So there could be uh, an opportunity cost um, by doing that. And an opportunity cost isn't always, it doesn't have to be monetary either. Uh, the opportunity cost is purely what you lose out on from making one decision as opposed to uh, making another. Um, so supposing um, if you were studying hard and one day your friends uh, asked you, you know, would you like to go out uh, and, and go um, uh, and go for a meal? There's opportunity costs for doing both. There's an opportunity you're missing out on both. If you stayed in and study, your opportunity cost is having a good time with your friends. But if you went out, the opportunity cost is missing out on the studying that you're doing. So an opportunity cost doesn't have to be monetary either. And it's what it's what you lose out on from making one decision as opposed to making another. So we reviewed the um, all the ingredients now for their relevant costs. So let's compare how much we actually spent 
to the relevant costs. So that's what we had at the start. We had the money spent and it was only the eight pounds for the butter. But then when we look at the relevant costs, let's compare that. Well, for the flour, we had to, um, we've got that replacement cost now of five pounds. For the butter, there's the opportunity cost of 12 pounds. So our relevant cost is 17 pounds. That's more than double the actual money spent. So if this were a business, our relevant cost was much higher making that cake than if we didn't make it. So if we'd gone ahead and said, oh, well, it's only a cost of eight pounds because that's how much we spent, we would be quite significantly underestimating the cost. So that's why it's so important to be aware of the relevant cost. So how do these skills uh, incorporate themselves uh, in business? Well, when we're looking at relevant costs, we're looking at uh, the things we've looked at today. We're looking at replacement costs. We're looking at sunk costs. Uh, we're looking at opportunity costs. There are other things as well that we could be looking at. Uh, there's potential savings from doing one uh, thing as opposed to another. Uh, so there's all these other things that make up the relevant costs that we can't look at today. And of course, this is only one thing that we do when uh, we're looking at making a strategy for a business. And what you're going to be doing in your course is you're going to be learning about all the other tools that you could do. You're going to be learning about how to budget, how to compare budgeted costs to, variant, um, to the actual costs. So you're doing a bit of variance analysis. You're going to be looking at investment appraisal. What are we expecting to get back over a long period of time? And all of these things is going to um, increase our skills, not only as an accountant, but as somebody with a, you know, a financially minded uh, business person. Because accounting uh, back in my day, it was more just about, you know, measuring debits and credits and income and expenditure. Nowadays, the expectation is you've got to be a lot more tuned up to what a business needs and be able to manage a business and make decisions about you know hiring people what products to do and so what we do here uh, at the university is we give you that all-rounded knowledge and these are all fantastic skills to have in my um line of work i've worked as a financial accountant in practice i've worked as a management accountant uh, for various businesses and now I'm in education. So the number of doors uh, that it opens up is, is potentially limitless. Uh, so, you know, by uh, enrolling onto this course, learning about what it means to be a professional uh, in accounting, um, you, you can set your sights um, as high uh, as you need to.